rules the day when Christ rules the soul. Christ is not valued at all unless he is valued above all. Therefore, life with Christ is an endless hope. But without Christ is a hopeless end. Life with Christ is an endless hope. But life without Christ is a hopeless end. Our topic tonight is the gifts of Christ to believers. What are the gifts which Jesus, our Savior, has given to his people, those who believe in his name? What are the scripturally stated gifts that Christ gave to us who believe? All this and more we are going to cover tonight. There are seven gifts of Christ to believers. There are seven of them. Namely, Christ gave us rest. He gave us the gift of keys to the kingdom. He gave us power over all the powers of the enemy. Fourthly, he gave us the living water. Fifth, he gave us the bread of heaven or bread of life. Sixth, he gave us eternal life. Seventh, he gave us the legacy of peace. All this we are going to cover, the seven gifts of Christ to the body of Christ. Now let's take them one by one. First, rest. Turn your Bible a moment in the book of Matthew chapter 11. Verse 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. See what Jesus said here. Come unto me, all ye who are loaded with heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Christ gave us rest. He did not give us restlessness. He gave us rest. Therefore, learn to rest under the mighty arm of God. Bring all your problems, all your difficulties, all the confusion of your life, hand them over to our Savior and take your rest. Take all those things that have been keeping you restless, sleepless, those things that have been keeping you wandering. Those things that have made you to be like orphan without a heavenly father. Bring them and hand them over to Christ. And he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your soul. Learn from me, says the Lord. He is lowly, gentle, humble. And you will find rest for your soul. For his yoke is easy. And burden is light. That's what he says. See, when we begin to allow the rest of the Lord to come upon our lives, what happens? We begin to surrender all that concerns us. Total surrender. Total surrender unto him. That these things that I'm going through is actually yours. It belongs to you, not, my, not me. In the book of Esther, chapter 33, verse 14, the Bible declared that God's presence brings about rest. When you embrace the rest of God, what happens? The presence of God will follow you everywhere you go. And every power of hell will be subdued. In the book of Psalms 116, verse 7, the Bible declared that the rest of God brings about a true repose to our soul. When you embrace the rest of God, you will receive a true repose to your soul. Your soul will be completely under the power of repose. In the book of 
Matthew 11, 29. God's rest is found in Christ's service. Because when you pick up the yoke of the Lord and begin to serve him, you will have rest in him. This rest is not given to you by the world. This rest is given to you by God. In the book of Hebrews chapter 4 verse 3, the Bible declared that God's rest is appreciated by faith. You got to receive this rest by faith. That's what we're talking about. You receive this rest by faith. This rest which God has given to us through Christ Jesus. You receive it by faith. In the book of Revelation chapter 14, verse 13, the Bible declared that the rest of God is eternal. It is not temporary. It is eternal. Isaiah chapter 28, verse 12 declares that we will lose the rest of God if we are stubborn. A stubborn soul will always be restless. There will be no rest for a stubborn soul. Our Jehovah God has prepared rest for us. He has given us rest from our troubles. That is why Jesus declared on the cross of Calvary that it is finished. It is finished. Whenever you are doing anything that bothers you, always remember that word. When Jesus said it is finished. Same thing when you pray. Remind the devil that my problems was dealt with on the cross of Calvary. Therefore it is finished. Don't accept no from Satan. He must bow. He must bow. That problem is solved on the cross of Calvary. Our Lord, our Savior, he gave us rest from struggle. And that is why he said, he has overcome the world for us. In the book of John chapter 16 verse 13, he said, in the world you have problems, you have difficulties, but in me you have rest. Because I have overcome the world for you. That's what he declared to us. He gave us rest from our enemy attack. Whatever it is, be it sickness, be it disease, always remind Satan that we are set free because of our Lord and Savior. Jesus gave us rest from the stress of the world. Don't ever say, I'm stressful. I'm getting stressed up. Because that is not your cup of tea. The Lord did not give you spirit of stress, but he gave you spirit of rest, and you need to rest. He gave us rest from confusion and frustration. Many times you see people getting frustrated. They scratch their hair, they shake their hair, they are getting frustrated. Why? Because you never know what it means to have that rest which the Lord has prepared for you 2,000 years ago. He gave us rest from misunderstanding. I always share this with people. If you have misunderstanding with anybody, Pull back and ask yourself why. Probably you are the problem. Misunderstanding comes only because of what? Selfishness. Self-centeredness. That's where misunderstanding comes. Because you want to lord over people. Because you want to control people. Because you want to dominate. Through domineering force. That's why there's misunderstanding. The Lord gave us rest from our toys someday. The world we live today is full of toys. You have to toil and dig. And work hard before you get whatever you want. But he gave us rest. That in all these things, we must embrace his rest and rest. You know what happens after going through what you go through in life? When you put your head down to sleep, just say, Lord, I take my rest in you. And you see how he take care of you? And never allow those things you go through to become Lord over your life. Turn your Bible a moment in the book of Hebrew. Hebrew chapter 4. Look at what the Bible said. This is very interesting. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9 through 11, it says, There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also seized from his works, as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter the rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Did you hear that? This is word of the Lord. For those of us who are restless. See what the Bible said. You're a believer. You're a child of God. You are born again Christian. You need to enjoy the rest which the Lord has prepared for you. That's what it is written there. It says, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. There is a rest for people of God. Therefore, don't be restless. Don't be stressed up. 
In verse 10, it says, For he who has entered his rest, that if you have entered the rest of God, you must also cease from your works, just as God sees from his works. There are many people who cannot sleep well. Why they are lying down to sleep, they are thinking of their work, thinking of their problem, thinking of misunderstanding with people, they will never rest. Yet they say they want to go and have their rest. If you have entered the rest of the Lord, you must cease from your works. Verse 11 says, Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. Let us be diligent to enter the rest of God so that we don't fall into what? Disobedience. That's what the Bible says there. So you see, the first thing the Lord gave us is rest. He doesn't want us to continue toiling and toiling and struggling and struggling 24 hours in a day. He wants you to have your rest. There is time for everything. Time for rest, you got to rest. We must know that. Secondly, the Lord our God gave us the keys of the kingdom. The keys of the kingdom. Turn your Bible in the book of Matthew chapter 16 verse 19. Keys of the kingdom. It says, And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. What a joy. Here Jesus said, I will give you the keys of, of the kingdom. You have the keys. What you bind is bound. What you lose is loose. What you bind on this earth will be bound in heaven. What you lose on this earth will be loose in heaven. You have the keys of the kingdom. The keys of the kingdom is in your hand. You don't need the devil to fool you. Make no mistakes about this. What you bind is bound. What you lose is loose. It does not matter what they are. Because God has given you that authority. The Bible declared how Joshua commanded the sun to stand still for 24 hours. Without moving. The same thing you have the authority. To bind and it shall be bound. You lose, you'll be loose. Because that is what Jesus said. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. You got the key. All you need to do is to maintain your life in order to hold on to that divine authority God gave to you. That's what we saw there. Keys are symbols of authority. You have the keys. Remember when Jesus rose again, he said, Behold, all keys are in his hands. All authority. You have the keys. In the book of Matthew chapter 18, verse 18, a moment. It confirmed there again. As surely, Jesus is speaking again. As surely I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be lose in heaven. This is the words of Jesus. What you bind is bound, what you lose is loose. That's what in crusades, after ministering to God, the word of God, what happens? You sit back and begin to command, begin to bind, and every secret, every disease will be completely bound. And you command them to go, and they obey. Because that's authority God gave to you. That is God's power over you. I shared this with you concerning our meeting in India, in crusade, where the man was in tubes, cancer, suffering from cancer. That man was a pastor. He wasn't a sinner. And when prayer was offered to God, binding those forces, Commanding those cancerous cells to be rounded up, arrested, dry up and go. And the man was set free. Because that is what God said. What you bind shall be bound, what you lose shall be loose. In the book of Jeremiah chapter 5 verse 14, the Bible says, God said, I'll put my words in your mouth. And that word will become like fire to consume the works of the enemy. In the book of Jeremiah, also 23, 29, the Bible says, the word of God in your mouth will be like a hammer to crush the powers of the enemy. That's the binding and losing we're talking about. There was a case, and listen carefully, a testimony of a little girl, a five-year-old girl, who was in a church with a mother. And that particular day, the pastor was speaking on binding and losing. So the pastor begin to speak about what I bind is bind, what you lose is lose. Begin to buy your problem and begin to lose God's blessing upon your life. 
If it's sickness, buy the sickness and lose healing. The pastor was preaching on this. After preaching, the church was over. And this five years old girl and the mother were going back home. And then we are going through the small path. You know how kids does? The kid was in front. The mother was at the back. Then the kid saw a snake, a rattlesnake, trying to cross over the path. The mother is right way back at the back while the girl is going in front. So the girl looked at the snake and said, why didn't you cross before we come? Why must you cross now that we are coming back from church? Anyway, I'm not going to kill you with anything, but I'll kill you with the word of God. The Bible says, what I bind on earth is bound in heaven. What I lose, I lose in heaven. Therefore, I bind it, turn around and die. And the snake turned around and died instantly. Instantly. So the mother was coming and saying, what's that, darling? Say, mom, is rattlesnake. Say, hey, run for your life. Don't play with rattlesnake. Say, no, mom, hold on a while. Hold on a while, mom. Say, what's up? Run for your life. He told the mother, the snake is dead. Say, who killed it? Say, mom, I didn't touch it. The Bible said, what I bound on earth, it bound in heaven. What I lose on earth, it's losing heaven. So I bound the snake. I said, turn around and die. And the snake turned around and died. The mother said, where did you learn this? Say, mom, pastor just preached in the church. The mother broke down and began to cry. You know, many mothers, while the preaching is going on, they are thinking about what to set up for lunch, thinking about, uh, is there chocolate in the fridge for children to take for supper? Do we have uh, uh, some fish for tomorrow's lunch or dinner? That's what they're thinking about. Only thinking how to take welfare of the family, but not their spiritual welfare. You see the problem? And that child began to minister to the mother, and the mother broke down. What you buy on earth is bound in heaven. But it loses it lose in heaven. That is why you can see even somebody with a big growth, be it tumor, be it anything, when you burn, you see that will disappear because that is God's word. That's why he said, command ye me with the words of my hands. That's his word. That's God's word. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 22, verse 22, you will see that Revelation 1, 18, Revelation 3, 7, Revelation 9, 1, and Revelation 20, verse 1. Keys, keys, a symbol of authority. Begin to bind and lose. If you are going for interview, the same thing you do. Right from home, bind every opposition force, every demonic influence, every power of the darkness that will try to influence the judgment of God. Right there, cancel them, bind them, and lose the presence of God. And you see, when you walk in, the atmosphere will be completely different. You will not be tensed up. Not when they ask you one plus one, you say nine. You'll be completely in your mind and know that God is in control. And God will take control of that. Because the Bible declared in the book of Psalm 107, verse 20, he sent forth his word to heal his people and to save them from destruction. So you got to be at home and send forth God's word, binding and losing. And you see what will happen. And that is God's word. Thirdly, he gave us power over all the powers of the enemy. Turn the Bible a moment in the book of Luke. Luke chapter 10, verse 19. The third gift that Christ gave to the body of Christ. Chapter 10, verse 19. Luke. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. You see what happens here. This is God's Give to you and I. Behold, I give you authority over all the powers of the enemy. It didn't say some power. Over all the power of the enemy. To trample upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall hurt you. All the powers. God gave you authority. Always remember this. When you are dealing with demonic attack or demonic influence or satanic host, remember that you have been given authority over them. Don't forget, this Luke chapter 10 verse 19. Behold, I receive authority from God. That's what you need to confess it. To trample upon serpents and scorpions over all the powers of the enemy. And nothing will hurt me. That's what we saw there. You must always remember that. Because this is the authority God gave you in anything you are doing. When your son is becoming wayward or become rebellious or your daughter. 
It is not him, it is the influence behind him. That is why Jesus said, get me behind Satan, when he was referring to Peter. He knew that Peter was not Satan, but there was influence over him. Therefore, you are dealing with humans. Those humans are agents of Satan. If you remove those agents from them, they will be fine guys. They'll be good people. But when they're under the influence of satanic forces, they begin to misbehave. And that's when you got to take authority. That's when you have to take authority. Be it your husband. If your husband is an unbeliever, you have authority spiritually over him. Whereby command, using the authority of Christ to command the devil that is in him to get out. But I'm not telling you to go back and call me, hey, husband, you are a Satan. That's not what I'm saying. But there are forces behind it. Every act of wickedness is based upon forces, which is contrary to God's word. Whatever and whatever you do, even if your boss is mean, you got to know that that boss is under the influence of demonic forces. And all you need to do is to be commanding the demons to get out of him when he's dealing with you because you are a child of God. This is something that we must learn. And the Bible declared that the power of God is what delivered us. In the book of Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 3, we are delivered by the power of God. In the book of Luke chapter 3, verse 8, the Bible declared that the power of God can raise children up. Can raise children up. In the book of Romans chapter 4, verse 21, the power of God fulfilled the promises of God. Whatever God has given you as promise, they must come to pass because the power of God will bring it to pass. It does not matter. Remember, the Bible declares and says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Why? Because the power of God is behind you. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 54, verse 10, the Bible declares, mountains and hills shall depart, but God's kindness and mercy will never depart from you. Why? Because the power of God is behind you. When you walk in righteousness and uprightness, without gossip and backbiting, you will be a living testimony that whatever, whenever you call upon God or you pray, God's power will back you up. You will not be a person who is used intermittently. Now you are used, next time you're not used. Many Christians are living life like that. Their life is, now they try to live holy. They don't want to gossip today. They don't want to do anything wrong. Then God uses them. Then tomorrow they get back to their vomit and begin to gossip. Then God's power lives. They are being used intermittently. But if you want to be a person who is used by God on daily basis, every moment, you got to shun evil. You got to be an upright person. In the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 9, verse 8, power of God made all grace abound. All grace abounds. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, power of God do exceedingly, abundantly, more than we ask and more than we think. It is power of God. In the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verse 21, power of God subdue all things. Everything will be subdued. It does not matter what people say about you. It doesn't matter what people think about you. I'm telling you the truth. When you live for God, God's power will subdue all powers that are against you. In the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 12, God's power, God, the treasure of our soul. God's power, God, the treasure of our soul. In the book of Hebrew, chapter 7, verse 25, God's power saves us to the uttermost. In the book of Jude, chapter 1, verse 24, God's power keeps us from falling. Many people will be looking for for you to close shop. Many people will be looking for for you to fall. Many people will be praying that you will not make it in life. Many people will be praying that they will hear that you, hear that you are involved with a scandal. But when you trust God, when you walk in righteousness, when you pray and never have bitterness in your heart, their prayer will never work. God's power will keep you from falling. The, man's, the thoughts of man will never be fulfilled in your life. But you always walk in the will of God. And those who are looking for your downfall will always be amazed by how God uses you and how you still stand your ground. That's the question many people ask you tomorrow. We don't know how he manages. One brother told me on Saturday, Pastor, it's amazing. I don't know how you manage a man who doesn't take salary, doesn't take offering from the church, but we don't know how you manage. I said, well, that's the power of God. That's the power of God. 
And God can do it in your own life if you are willing to just believe. We know many ministers who go for mission, not asking a cent from anyone. We know of a man of God who went to pray for somebody and come back and tell the wife, I think we need to pray that God will give us a car that we can be doing this work. And less than five days, somebody who is not all that too familiar, I mean, somebody never met for maybe a year, call up and say, I want to buy you a car. When you walk in righteousness, God's power will back you up. When you walk in all brightness, heaven's power will be by you in everything that you do. And that's an encouragement. In the book of Matthew, chapter 14, verse 20, God's power multiplied loaves for people to eat the disciples. In the book of Matthew, chapter 14, verse 25, God's power made mankind to walk on the sea. You break record. In the book of Mark, chapter 4, verse 39, God's power steals the tempest. When the tempest, the wind, one wind came, it was still by God's power. In the book of John, chapter 2, verse 7, God's power turned water into wine. This is power of God in demonstration. He gave you that part of authority. Behold, I give you power. He gave us power. God did not leave us powerless. Never. You can be in the aircraft. If there are turbulence, you are the one God can use to steal the turbulence. You can speak for the word. Turbulence, stop in the name of Jesus. We want to have a smooth ride. That's your job right there. Because you can make a difference. You are the one God wants to use to make a difference that right there. You are the one. It could be confusion. Maybe there are people who say they are going to fight. They are going to do that. They just go at a corner and pray. And you see, those confusion will be completely wiped away. There will be joy everywhere because somebody has prayed. Someone is praying. Someone is praying. Christianity is not a religion. It's God in you. It doesn't matter what you preach. It's your lifestyle. We read the Bible. People out there doesn't read the Bible. We are the Bible they read. What is our lives? What kind of life do we live? Fourth gift of Christ to the body, to the believers. Living water. He gave us the living water. Turn the Bible a moment in the book of John. Chapter 4, verse 14. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. That's the water we're talking about. The water that you receive from the Lord. Water you drink, you'll never be thirsty anymore. Wherever you go, whatever you're doing, you'll be a person springing up without water. And anyone who comes close to you will never feel dry. You know, there are some times when you go to fellowship with somebody, just a few minutes, you become dry. Because that person doesn't talk anything that edifies you. That person doesn't say anything that builds you up. Whatever they talk is complaining. Every time are there in the car, even if somebody is giving them lift, they are talking about people. Don't befriend such person. The person will drain you up. Don't get involved with drainers. Living water drainers. You must learn to build yourself up. No need to sit in a place with somebody that gossiping. Every time gossiping, they have no job talking and talking. They don't talk something that will defy you. They don't say something that will make you to feel, oh, I just thank God for the presence of God. That's why you see them, they don't grow. They're stagnated. That's how they live their lives. You can't see anything good in them. Anytime you see them, they are just totally dried, spiritually dried up. But they pretend as if everything is okay. Hard wash. That's not true. That's why Jesus declared in the book of John again, chapter 7. John chapter 7. Look at verse 37 through 39. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Look at that. If you believe, 
Out of you will flow rivers of living water. That's what the Bible says there. Will you be a person that from you people can draw? That is why if you call somebody a friend, it's easy to determine who wants to be a child of God or who wants to be a child of devil. It doesn't matter what they claim. Just a few minutes you sit with somebody, what comes out of their mouth will tell you if that person is a Christian or not. Because as a child of God, born again Christian, you're supposed to be speaking edifying words. Anybody around you must receive word that is encouraging. Word that will build you up. Word that will keep you bubbling for God. Not those words that will dry you up and drain you out. Because the Bible, Jesus said it, out of that person will flow the living water. Because the inflow of the living water will bring about the outflow and the outflow will bring about the overflow. That's what it is. You can't give what you don't have. What do people have today? Gossip, criticisms, cutting down people. But what I want to tell you something. Don't worry when somebody talks about you because you are not the first, you will not be the last. Keep on working with God and the more they talk to you, the more they go down. But the Jesus said, "Go." The Bible said, "If the way of a man is pleasing unto God, he will make your enemy to bow." So keep on working with God. Don't worry about what they say. They are giving you unsolicited advertisement, and people get to know you. <laughs> You're there, so you don't worry. You don't pay for it. You just thank God for it. Praise the Lord. At least somebody's talking about you. With me, you're so good. So that's what we must learn. So go and drink that water. And the Bible complete in verse 39. But he is, but this he spoke concerning the spirit whom those believing in him will receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because he was not yet glorified. So that's the thing, the symbol of the Holy Ghost, living water. Go and draw it from the Lord. When you go in the book of Isaiah 49 verse 10, Isaiah 55 verse 1. Now I would like us to read Jeremiah 17 a moment. Jeremiah 17, verse 23. I see what the Bible says about this living water we're talking about. Jeremiah 17, 13, please, 13. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be ashamed. Those who depart from you, from me, shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. Look at that's a powerful word here. Jeremiah is proclaiming. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be ashamed. If you forsake the Lord directly or indirectly, you'll be ashamed. Those who depart from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of the living waters. When your name is written on the earth, which means when the wind blows, it is wiped out. Which means it is not a good thing when somebody says your name is written on the sand. Because God is the hope of Israel. Now let's look a little bit about this living water. The Bible told us in the book of Zechariah chapter 14 verse 8 that this living water is not affected by time and season. It is not seasonal. It is there every time. It's not affected by time or season. Secondly, it comes from the Lord, from the house of God. And thirdly, this living water, the source is Jesus Christ. John chapter 4 verse 10. The supply of this water is inexhaustible. Inexhaustible. It doesn't exhaust. It can't say it's finished. Book of Revelation chapter 7 verse 17 tells us that. It does not finish. There's no such thing as where the living water is over. No, it's always there. In the book of Revelation chapter 22 verse 1 through 2, the living water makes life fruitful. When you have the living water in you, you become a fruitful person in your ministry, in your family. In your relationship with people, you become fruitful. People will see you living right. You'll be a person who stands for the truth and nothing but the truth. You'll not be a manipulative person. You'll not be a person who dangles like a, changes color like a chameleon. You stand for the truth. You couldn't be bothered what people have to say about you. In the book of Revelation 22 verse 17, this water is universal. Therefore, we are called to partake. Everyone is invited to partake in Revelation 22 verse 17. Come and drink of this water so that you have a total change of life. So your life will never be the same again. So be completely a changed person. That's what that portion of the scripture says. So will you come and drink of this living water and receive all that God has for you? 
The fifth gift <coughs> the Lord gave to us is the bread of heaven. In the book of John, a moment. John, chapter 6. Bread of heaven. Jesus gave to us. Chapter 6, verse 32 through 35. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Most did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give all this bread always. Verse 35. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Look at that. Jesus is the bread of heaven. He is the bread that comes from heaven. If you eat of him, you will never hunger again. Come and receive that bread. The bread of life. He is the bread of life. He is the word. The Bible declares in the book of John chapter 1 verse 1, In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word is God. He is the word. Come and enjoy. Come and eat of him. You will never thirst again. That's why Job proclaimed and said, I treasure your word more than the very food that I eat because the word of God is the spiritual food for us. Now in, the, in verse 48 through 51 of the same portion of the scripture, John 6, 41 through 48 through 51, it says, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Yes, he is the bread of life. If we eat of it, we will never die again. In verse 58, this is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. Jesus is the bread of life. If you eat of him, you will never die again. So eat of him and be a living testimony for his glory so that people will see that you are a child of the living God. Sixth point, the sixth gift, eternal life. Turn your Bible a moment in the book of John, chapter 10, verse 28. John 10, 28. It says, And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. What God has given to his son, no one will take them away. Are you part of the team that God has given to the son? Jesus Christ. If you are one of them, you will never play with sin. You will never be part of wickedness. You will never be part of evil. You always remember that you are part of the team. Which team? Heaven bound team. You are on your way to heaven. You will never allow the enemy to rob you your eternal destiny, which is eternal life in Christ. Many of us are playing with our eternal life. Because we think that, well, anything goes. It, it's not anything goes. You have to think about your life. Where will you spend your eternity? In hell or heaven? If the Lord were to come today, are you ready to go? You might ask me a question. What are the conditions for eternal life? There are conditions for eternal life. And that those conditions must be fulfilled. First, in the book of Luke, chapter 18, verse 28 through 30, we must renounce the world. We must not be part of the world. We must not be engaged with the things of the world. That's why the apostle says, James declared in the book of James, chapter 4, verse 4, adulterous and adulteresses, don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? If you love the world or the things of the world, you are enemy of God. You must be an exemplary person who shun evil. Many times people say that they are in the world, they cannot deny water. They are like fish in the water, they cannot deny water. That's not true. We are not like fish in the water that cannot deny water. We are like oil mixed with water. Oil must find its level. You must understand that. Denounce the world. Though you are in the world, you are not part of the world. 
1 John chapter 2, verse 15 and 16 says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If the love of the world is in you, the love of the Father is not in you. What are the love of the things of the world? The pride of life, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes. These are not of the Father. For the things of the world pass away, but God stands forever. Secondly, another condition that needs to be fulfilled. We must have faith in Christ. John chapter 3, verse 14 through 15, and also verse 36. We must have faith in Christ. Because Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. No man can go to the Father except by him. Our faith must be in Christ Jesus. This is a condition that needs to be fulfilled. No other way you can use to go to heaven except through Christ Jesus. Thirdly, spiritual service. John chapter 4, verse 35 through 36. We must learn to perform spiritual service. Be part of the evangelist. Evangelism team, win souls. Bible says, he that winned a soul is wise. Do you know why we cannot win souls? Because we don't live according to God's word. Follow what I say, but don't do what I do. Our life does not depict Christ. We are not acting as Christ's ambassadors. As the Bible told us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. If we are Christ's ambassadors, wherever we go, there will be shout of hallelujah. Our life be a complete changed life. Life that is completely immersed in the ocean of God's love and grace. That's what we're talking about. So we ask this question, are you involved with that? The best evangelism is not what you speak. The best evangelism is lifestyle evangelism. How do you live? It's easy. Anyone can preach. Anyone can talk. Anyone can shout. Anyone can scream. But what about your life? Does your life show that you are a child of God? This is something you must learn. That we must behave as Christians. The Bible declares in the book of Acts, chapter 11, verse 26, that the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch, not because they were carrying banners and said we are from Deep Alive Christian Center, or because they come and say we are from this church or that church, but because they behave like Christ. Those you are working with in the office, can they declare that you are a child of God? Your colleagues, your peers, your bosses. Can they say, yes, this person, something is different in his life? Your neighbors, can they see something different? Or you are just the same thing like anybody else? Some people like to behave like anybody else. You don't need to behave like anybody else. You need to depict Christ. You need to be an exemplary person. The way you talk, so that when people come close, they know surely this person, something is different in your life. Be it in your leadership style, be it in anything that you do. People come close, they say something is different. And you tell them, this is Christ. Thirdly, and fourthly, John chapter 12, verse 25, self-sacrifice. For us to have eternal life, there must be self-sacrifice. Are you willing to sacrifice? Sacrifice your pleasure for the sake of the kingdom. Sacrifice your leisure for the sake of the kingdom. Sacrifice for the, for the sake of the expansion of God's kingdom. Are you willing to sacrifice? There is no reward without a sacrifice. There is no price paid that will not be rewarded either. When you take a step of faith, heaven will back you up. Are you willing to sacrifice? Are you willing to lay down your life? Jesus said, what a great price that a man laid down his life for his friends. Are you willing to bring your Isaac and put it at the altar? Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to do that? That's a question. Especially such a time like this. Are you willing to reach the unreached, touch the untouched, love the unloved, and teach the untaught? Next, John chapter 17, verse 3. Knowledge of God. We must have the knowledge of God. In the world, we say knowledge is power. When you have the knowledge of God, you're able to do great exploits for the Lord and for his kingdom. You're able to do great things for the great God. Knowledge. Are you willing to acquire God's knowledge? Know who he is. That's what Paul support. I'm sorry, Daniel the prophet declared and said that those who have the knowledge of God will do great exploits. 
If you know God, do you know him? Do you know him? Do you have that relationship? Do you have that relationship? So you can begin to grow from faith to faith, glory to glory, and grace to grace. Galatians chapter 6 verse 8. Sowing in the spirit. Are you willing to be sowing in the spirit? Not in the flesh. But when you sow in the spirit, you reap spiritual things. But you sow in the flesh, you reap in flesh. Are you willing to sow? Regardless of what people have done against you, you are willing to go extra mile for their comfort. Pray for them. Even when you know that somebody is doing something against you, though they pretend, you still reach out to them in prayer. And give yourself to prayer. And say, Lord, search my heart. Do not cast me away. Do not take away the Holy Spirit from me. But draw me close to you. The seventh gift our Lord gave to us. Legacy of peace. John chapter 14. Verse 27 a moment. John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives. Do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither it be afraid. The peace he gave to us. He gave us his peace. Do you have the peace of God? Many people are living in pieces today. I always say it. Either you live in peace of God or you live in pieces. Many are living in pieces, not in peace. How many times have you said, I will give him a piece of my mind? Now listen carefully. When you give somebody a piece of your mind, you end up losing your own peace. That's what happens. I give him a piece of my mind. When you give somebody a piece of your mind, you end up losing your own peace. It's just like sometimes people say, I will teach him a lesson. Now listen, when somebody tells you, I will teach you a lesson, tell the person, thank you, because I'm sorry that there's no lesson to teach other than the lesson Christ has taught you, and that lesson is love your neighbor as you love yourself. <laughs> so that's the only lesson you need to learn. Any other lesson behind this is not a lesson. It's out of wickedness. That's something we must also learn. The Bible declared and said, the peace of God brings gift into our lives. Psalms 29 verse 11. It brings gift. The peace of God is abundantly given to us. Psalms 119 verse 165. In the book of Isaiah 26 verse 3, the peace of God is perfect. That's why I say, you will keep him perfect peace because he trusts in you. Trust you in Jehovah for he is your everlasting strength. In the book of Isaiah 48 verse 18, the peace of God is like a river. It flows through your soul and calm a troubled soul. That's what Paul Paul declared in the book of Philippians chapter 4 verse 8, verse 7 rather. He said, the peace of God passes all understanding. It passes all understanding. It passes also all, un all misunderstanding. If you have the peace of God in your heart, you surely know that it passes all understanding and all misunderstanding. A moment in the book of Psalm chapter 4 verse 8. Psalms 4 verse 8. I will both lie down in peace and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. We will lie down in peace. For our God make us to dwell in safety. These are the things that God Almighty has given to us. We must not forget these seven gifts that the Lord has given to us. The gift of rest. The keys to the kingdom. The power over all the powers of the enemy. The gift of the living water. The bread of heaven. The eternal life. And peace. That's what he has given to us. If you don't have these things, you better begin to ask yourself questions. Why am I not having these things? These are God's blessings for your life. The will of God is to bless you, to keep you, and continue to support you that you move on. Have your rest. If you have taken the rest of the Lord, relax. 
Cease from your works. Cease from struggling. Relax. Because he himself also relaxed when he has finished his work. Enter into God's rest. Don't be disobedient. Enter and relax. That is the blessing of the Lord for your soul. When you hear the voice of God, you know how to your heart. 